So I've been calling varieties, but it's difficult. It's difficult to let them go. And with the well, Arctic I, blast, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Oh, no, that's what I was going to get into is that you had mentioned that with the Arctic blast, it killed a lot of stuff directly down to the ground. And, and maybe it's killed them even further than that, because last year I decided I'm, I'm going to quit putting varieties in the ground that I haven't proven yet, that mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I really want to keep. So I have about 100 varieties right now in pots. And I didn't winterize them all that much because our, our winters are typically pretty mild. And I didn't learn of the Arctic blast until the very last minute. So I oh, ran wow. out, I ran out and put tarps over everything really quickly. But I'm not sure how much protection they really got. It, it was unbelievably cold. Uh, it was right around zero degrees. The wind was blowing so hard the wind chill was estimated predicted to be about 30 below but in our mountains here we get a lot more wind so we we probably had wind chill of about 50 below and what what is what growing zone are you in 7b 7b okay that's good We're pre pretty close to eight pretty close to eight so typically you know no, i don't have to worry I don't have to worry too much, typically. But that was cold. That was really cold. We um, had this similar experience. I think we talked about, and not often that we really get down. But I was worried when we got down to like twenty-seven. I was reading on how we could actually help. Whether it was to run sprinklers, we came across some data that if you actually water the trees, it helps. Mm -hmm. Um, warms the soil up a little bit. Yeah, it keeps the roots from freezing. Instead of dry, instead of having the drier, which makes you know, sense. It makes well, sense. It kind of makes sense when you consider that, like um, where we're at, there's a lot of the almond and olive trees and things like that. And when chill hits, they will turn on the sprinklers and just let them run. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or uh, we grew up in Napa where, you know, the vineyards, they would have those giant industrial fans that would just, you'd hear them at like three o'clock in the morning, just going crazy, trying to keep the um, airflow going because it uh, brings the temperature up just enough to keep the, the blossoms from freezing. That doesn't, yeah, that, that, uh, or the, uh, the propane burners, mm -hmm. they'd have burners in the, um, the vineyard smudge pots to, of course, they eradicated that. They're gross. <laughs> but, um, or the couple weekends ago when we came home and uh, it was snowing, that was pretty scary too. Where I was calling friends on the East Coast, hey, what do I do? <laughs> Who can I call at? At our three o'clock in the morning, you're roughly five o'clock in the morning. And, uh, get a helping hand. So I could definitely understand the uh, fear of the loss. Well, and Ross was the one that oh, was yeah. able to. So he messaged me. He was up early that morning. He messaged me back and said, Dave, don't worry. It's going to be all right. <laughs> he actually, um, if I look back, I think it was like, as long as it go below 22 degrees, and I might get this wrong uh, exactly. I'd be okay in pots. Typically, um, and I think it was down like 10 degrees, I'd be okay in ground. Well, a lot of our collections in pots, so. Unfortunately, it didn't didn't last too long, the snow. But as you well know, you never you never know. All it takes is one node and mm -hmm. it might come back from the roots. Exactly. Well, the, with the Arctic blast, it, it may end up being my friend because I have such a hard time getting rid of varieties. It'll do it, the, the hard work it, for you. It may, it may have gotten rid of a lot of my varieties, especially the ones in pots. But the ones in pots are a lot of the ones I'm I'm still trialing. But if they end up dead, I have to make a decision not to get rid of it, but do I really want to reacquire it? Which is a totally different. You know, decision to to make. 
so the Arctic blast may have well, uh, called some varieties for me. Do you have and I remember you mentioned that generally you don't get dieback during the winter. No, I don't. Uh, mo most of my trees are pretty cold hardy for the temperatures that we deal with. Uh, some of my trees are, are, you know, easily 12, 14 foot high. And that's with really, yeah, yeah, they're, they're pretty big. And, you know, once they get established, they're very cold hardy. But I tell you, my Nora de Barbantane, it, it hasn't suffered any damage until, um, until the Arctic blast. I mean, it, it was very cold hardy, but the Arctic blast, it, 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 it'll be lucky to come back from the ground. I mean, the top is just, there's no life in it. And then there are other varieties. Uh, I'm totally shocked. I, I got green coming out on a lot of these trees now. Uh, I mean, we're we're only in March, and I have a number of trees. I'm shocked. They had hardly any damage whatsoever. My emerald strawberry, I mean, it's still a nice-sized tree. Um, my laterula agrostarts, it didn't suffer any damage whatsoever. None. Zero. And I've got really? a number of trees. Yeah. And, and that's one that I was thinking of calling because, you know, it's not true to type or it's a variety that everybody disagrees. I Actually, there's probably at least a dozen or two strains of white, white Marseille. So that, that's pretty important um, to know what varieties will actually um, are hardy in uh, cold temperance. Well, yeah, we see, I, I, I don't know that I would draw any hard conclusions on what is actually making them hardy. Um, some of these varieties are not known to be hardy. And it, I have to question, is it the conditions? You know, is the soil different or are they getting different nutrients? I, I don't automatically draw the conclusion that is often done that uh, the fruit is based so much on the genetics, the cold hardity is based so much on genetics. Not that it isn't, but there are other factors. And do you, do you, I know that you had said that you live in um, like a national forest. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that offers some protection, like it no, creating no. a little microclimate or no? No. If anything, we get more wind here. Um, hmm. our, our winters are pretty, pretty windy, much more so than our summers. And huh. in, in particular, our specific location, it's, it's like a big funnel. The way the wind comes in, the mountains funnel the wind and make it more windy. <clears throat> but... You know, I, I, I don't know what the conditions are uh, for, for cold hardiness. I know that potassium is really important for cold hardiness. Uh, Calcium is very important. Uh, you, you, if, if you're deficient in either one of those two, and even sodium it, as a micronutrient, sodium is very important for cold hardiness. I'm sure there are many factors that go into whether a tree can survive certain temperatures and it's not just heredity. I think it's a big mistake to think that heredity is as important as a lot of people make it out to be. And see how quick that you, we can go down a rabbit hole when we're talking about figs. Yep. Yep. But so many of them. I mean, with 2,000 varieties, 2,000, I just want to circle back to that information and on the database. Now that 2017 is the year that you initially established this information online, making it available, right. even if it was just your varieties. Oh, it wasn't even, actually, it wasn't just my varieties. And oh, fact, I, didn't, I, I didn't even have that much experience. Um, I, I think I, I may have even put some people off because I was a complete newbie. I didn't know anything. And I still feel pretty stupid, even after all these years. It, it, was, more, it was more based upon the fact that I couldn't 
grapple with the amount of information and how it was just dis- dispersed all over the place. Um, you know, I would learn certain things from Ross and I'd learned certain things from our figs and I'd learned certain things from the figs for fun forum, but it was all over the place and trying to bring it all together and wrap my mind around it. I just needed a way to try to understand what it was I was buying or wanting to buy or certain things to look for. And it started with the spreadsheet, but the spreadsheet became unmanageable. There was no way to filter it. There was no way to like find certain aspects that were like the season in one column and maybe the cold hardiness in the other and filter on that. It, It couldn't do it. So I needed a database to do that. Once I got to about 200, 250 varieties, I knew it it was unmanageable from a spreadsheet perspective. I needed a database and I needed some way to filter and bring all that together. So 250 varieties, you you spoke about the first year that you you had 75 and that was in 2016 or was that 2017? 17, 17, yeah. I mean, that sounds like a... uh, Sounds like normal of us. I mean, <laughs> that's normal. That yeah. first year, another one of our friends just started last year, and I call him a friend because I mean, we spend a lot of time with uh, Nick uh, Paselli, and he went from he had one fig, and then he, and within, um, I think he's up to like fifty right now, different varieties, and they're all doing great. Well, and he has an advantage of he's in SoCal, so he's got beautiful weather yes. basically all year round. <laughs> but with that, that wonderful, oh, this is pretty cool. Collecting figs is pretty easy. They grow very easily. They don't take up a lot of room, especially if you keep them in containers. So it's very easy to see somebody within their first year grab, uh, you know, 17 and just go with it. When did you hit 250? Um, probably a year and a half ago, something like that. Two, two years. Are, are you asking me varieties that I grow or on on the database? Oh, so that was two. So he so he started with the the 75 cuttings that yeah. he grew out. Yeah, in 2017. But I killed and about now a third he's of those. Up to- I killed about a third of those. <laughs> been, been there too. Um, and now you're up to about 325 varieties that you so have to... are personally growing out. Yep. Sorry, with the, I was just trying to, that second you, you were talking about the database having 250 varieties. I just figured within a couple of years that you had 250. Well, yeah, yeah. I would imagine. Timeline wise, six. It's been six years since he started, and he's got three hundred and twenty-five. So by yeah, you kill the third. So we're circling back to talk about um, the figure, the information that you compiled. You started compiling this in two thousand seventeen, mm-hmm. and the, the first year, you how many varieties did you have on the site? Oh, well, when I built the site, I think I started with about 200 or 250 varieties. And I just kept adding to it continually after that. And it would ebb and flow, it might, the amount of effort I put into the site. Because sometimes I, I'm just so busy, I, I don't do anything. Um, but I've been pretty regular with the site. Uh, most of the work I've been doing over the past year has been on the back end things that people aren't seeing uh, basically trying to restructure the site for many reasons. There's a lot of features that I've been trying to develop for years and I, I'm no, I'm no programmer. I'm not a website developer. I'm not a database guru. I'm not even a fig guru, but all these different things I was trying to accomplish over time. It's just been slowly getting to where I envisioned the site to be from the beginning. 